Uh, so man was made of the uh, of the low things of the earth, whether it was dust, literal dust, or just the low things of the earth. Who knows? I, I don't know. But a man was a modern man was made of the low things of the earth, and woman was made from his blood. And of course, she was a symbol of Christ and His Church, and that's one of the reasons, one of the reasons we were, that a woman was made from His blood, just as we are reborn from Christ in His blood and His sacrifice. And we're literally, you know, God is a spirit; He's not flesh and blood as we are. He's a spirit. His words, and you know, Jesus said, "My words are spirit in their life." So the DNA of God is His word. So, and I'm talking about his pure word, not to, not mistranslations, but the, the pure word. It is spirit and it is life. So if you take it into you, you're literally taking into your spirit and you're taking into your life. You're not born with it. I know people want to say we're all, all born with a soul that will be you know, living somewhere forever, but that's not true. Man is born with a human soul and a human, uh, a human body and a human soul and the spirit of man is God's spirit that keeps us alive and that spirit goes back to God who gave it whenever we die he just sort of reabsorbs it it's a uh, it's his breath the word spirit in his breath and when God breathed into man he became a living soul it was a dead body laying there it was created from the dust of the earth whatever that is and God breathed into him and then he became a living soul you don't have a living soul, you are a living soul. It means you're a, a being that's able to think. You know, that's what you are. You're a being that with knowledge that's able to think. So your soul is really just who you are, is your your person. Doesn't matter if you know when you if a person loses a hand, they're still the who they are, you know. If they lose a leg, they're still the who they are. If I lose all their members, except you know enough to stay alive, they're still themselves. So you're not any part of your body. You are what you think. You you are your mind. You are your consciousness. And God says, the consciousness or the soul that sinned, it shall die. In other words, when consciousness sins against God, it dies. It will not live on in some other body forever, regardless. That's what, that's a man-made error and a lie. God brought us into this world and give us a chance to live forever if we chose to, if we chose to love Him and choose to love Him of our own free will. But if we do not, we're not going away into an everlasting lake of fire and torment like the church is trying to tell us. We'll go away in everlasting fire, whatever that is, probably God Himself. I have no idea. But we're going away into everlasting, you know, we're made of the dust of the earth men and women were made from our blood and then of course we all as Christians are made of one blood which is Christ whenever you come to Christ by faith I said all that to say this whenever you come to Christ by faith and and we actually become what they call born again we're not eternal you know we're not eternal in ourselves we have to receive that as a gift you have to receive the gift of eternal life and uh you know, whether we receive it completely now or when we, if we receive it when Christ returns a second time, we receive a part of it now. It says you have passed from death unto life if you love the if you love the brethren, you know. But at the same time, you've got to stay in that. You know, you've got to stay in the love of God. It says you have to endure to the ends. And Christ said, "My my reward is with me to give every man and woman according to their works." So it's not about uh, it's you, you're not working your way to heaven. So, you know it's all by grace. The works are just as rewards. You know it's just about rewards. But a person who has rejected Christ, if they have been given the opportunity to know the truth, I, I don't mean just people who who rejected church. You know a lot of people rejected a lot of people rejected uh, television evangelism or. or you know, church as usual. A lot of people have rejected that type of stuff. You know, I don't. I don't mean that. I'm talking about if you have rejected Christ, knowingly and willfully, after you knew the truth that He died for your sins, and you have to make Him 
your Savior and Lord to be saved, to, to live on. That's what to be saved means. A lot of people don't even understand what we mean. You know, we who have been raised in church take it for granted what we mean by saved and and all these types of things. And uh, a lot of times I don't even think that the, the church people even understand what they mean by saved. We just know we use that word. You know, what have we been saved from? Well, in, in a uh, rocket science world of today, I'll just tell you what you've been saved from. You have been saved from obliteration. You've been saved from your consciousness going out of existence and, and never, ever being again. You know, that, that's what you've been saved from. Because if you reject Christ, who is only payment for sin, because God is righteous, you, know, you understand? He is totally holy and totally righteous, and we are not. And a lot of times we don't think God is righteous. We think that he's made a few mistakes here and there. We don't understand his word. Uh, sometimes his word is mistranslated. And when it's not mistranslated, we just don't understand it, you know, because he says things a certain way, and we think we ought to always understand exactly what it means. And God said in his word that his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And he said, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my thoughts above yours. You know, so to put it in a, a, a scientific type age, I reckon, uh, if we look down at an ant, I like to use this a lot, if we look down at an ant on the ground and try to explain to the ant who we are, what our name is, what we do for a living, why we drive cars, all this type of stuff, you know, you just sit there and look at us. Maybe, maybe run the other way, maybe come up and bite us. You know, but bottom line, he wouldn't retain it because he doesn't have the intellect in what we'd be saying to him. And that's how we are with God, the creator of the whole universe, the one who's bigger than everything that is. Not just our solar system, but all the millions of solar systems that are out there. And maybe, you know, billions. The bottom line is, he made it all. He's bigger than it all. He's not a man. He, he's not an old man with a white beard. He is a, he's a consciousness. If we were to put it in our terms, he is a consciousness. He's a living energy force, and he made everything. He is also a she. Now, don't get me wrong, he's not a hermaphrodite. I simply mean, you know, God has names that are both male and female in the Old Testament because he is both. I say he for a you know, general argument, but he is both as far as, he doesn't have a sex one way or another. But he has the, all the good points of a man and all the good points of a woman and none of our bad points. You know, all of our bad points are of this earth, of this fallen world. All of our good points are from him. Every good and perfect gift comes from God. So God is into being masculine and God is into being feminine. You know, he is both. A lot of people don't realize that, you know. Just because we're calling God Father doesn't mean that he does not have female attributes. And Jesus Christ, Yeshua, showed us the female attributes of Christ, oh, excuse me, of God. He showed us the female attributes of God because he used female words. He was a man, but he used female words when he was talking about Israel. He says, how many times would I have gathered you as a hen gathers her chicks? You know, he could have used anything he wanted to use. He could have used any expression he wanted. He could have said, how many times I would have gathered you like any father will gather. You know, he could have said that. But he didn't say that. He said, how many times will I have gathered you as a hen gathers her chicks because Christ was functioning as all God. Now, he had the spirit without measure. You know, we, we have it in measure. He had it without measure which means he had the breath in God without measure. It means he had the inspiration in God without measure. He was God. He was God in the flesh. He was the Word become flesh. In other words, the Word of God created him in Mary's womb to begin with. No man helped do that. He was all by God and only by God. And from the time he was born, he was nothing but 
a living, breathing example of the Word of God. He says, in the beginning, this is John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. It didn't say entered flesh, it says He became flesh. The very flesh of God was crucified on the cross because I, he, beca he didn't, he's not flesh, but he became flesh. You understand? He was not always flesh. He decided to become it. You know, he became flesh for us, for our sake. And he had it in his design all along. A lot of people think, well, you know, God's creation, God's creation went out of whack, you know, and so he was throwing up his hands wondering what to do and finally decided, oh my God, I gotta die for him. That's not the way it worked. From the very day God ever even thought about this earth, and that goes back billions and billions and billions of years, he knew there'd be a time there'd be an Adam and Eve, and thereafter, us, you and I, and he knew exactly what he was going to do to show us who he was, and to show us what he was. He was love. He is the very spirit. He, she, is the very spirit of love, period. And how better to show your love than to die for the person that you love? So, naturally, he brought the law into existence when we were not perfect, which brought death. And, you know, that, that the law was perfection, but we were not perfect. So, therefore, we, we were shown right away that we're not God. You know, if we could have kept the law perfectly, then maybe we were, we were God, but we can't. Anyhow, uh, the bottom line is... He showed us real quick that we were not God when He gave us a few simple commandments that His Son, His only Son, kept without fail easily. And we couldn't keep the first one. You know, you think you have kept them all, but you really haven't. The Bible says if you've hated your, your brother without a cause, you're a murderer. So, you know, every one of us has done that at a time or two in our life, and, and therefore we're murderers. It says if you broke one, you broke every one of them. So you name the law and what it says, and we broke every one of them. So we're just as guilty in, in God's eyes as anybody else that we're condemning. That's why it says don't condemn, it says to love. So that's the whole point of human beings being put on this earth, is to learn one thing, and that's how to love. But you cannot love until you first learn to love God, and, and you cannot love God until you first know who He is. God is both the father and the mother, if you want to look at it that way. He is both. Now, don't go, don't go saying John said that God is the mother goddess. No, I didn't say that. I said just as Adam had the attributes of a woman inside of him, and God took them out, and so God has all the attributes inside of him of a woman, while also having all the attributes of a man. And he told us to call him father, so that's what I do. So... God, the Father, decided to become God the Son. If you don't believe that, just look at the Old Testament prophecy of Christ. Speaking of Christ, it wasn't speaking of God the Father, speaking of Christ. And he said, He shall be called the everlasting Father. So the Father became the Son. And he did so of his own free will. And when he went back to heaven, he came back as the Holy Spirit. And he was always God the Spirit, and never failed. That's what God is. He is a Spirit. And that's what the Holy Spirit is. He is God the Holy Spirit, and he is the last, the last one who's going to reach out to humanity. God the Father reached out in the Old Testament. God the Son reached out in the New Testament, and is still reaching out. But it's God the Holy Spirit is reaching out right now. It's his Spirit. And really, His Spirit is just another manifestation of God the Father and God the Son. You know, it's, it's all the same. It's three manifestations in one God. It's not three different gods. I, I think sometimes even us Pentecostals and us Protestants have it wrong. And, uh, and even Catholics, Catholics, Protestants all have it wrong. It's not three different gods. It's not even three different, you know, the way we, way we always say it. It's three different manifestations of the same God. The only reason Christ prayed is because He did it for our sake. 
He told the father, he says, I know you hear me always. The reason he knew that he heard, yeah, he heard him always when he prayed because he was the father. He said, when you have seen me, you've seen the father. Because his disciples said to him, he said, Lord, show us the father. And he said, I've been with you all this time and you, and you don't know me. He said, when you've seen me, you've seen the father. Only well, he was the father in earthly form. The Father was a spirit, and, and in particular, He was the Word. And the Word became flesh and, and become and dwelt among us as the Son. And when He went back to heaven, or, or back to the spiritual realm, and He came back, He came back as the Holy Spirit. And there's plenty of Bible for that. Because you know, Christ said, I will not leave you comfortless. He said, I'll go back. Now, he used words like, I'll go back to the Father, and I'll pray the Father, and he'll send you another comforter like unto me. He, he did, you know, he said all that. But he did that in order to, he was talking to people who didn't quite understand everything. And he said, I'm, I can't tell you everything now. He said, when the Holy Spirit comes, he'll lead you to all truth. He was he was talking to people who were still in the in the baby form. They were they were still in not even understanding themselves everything he said. They didn't even realize when he told them outright that he was going to die at the hands of sinners. They didn't understand it. He said, "I'm going to die and I'm going to rise again," and they still didn't realize it. They never realized it until he was walking and talking with them, and you know, started opening the scriptures and and, th and then broke bread, I believe it was, and. Uh, finally, you know, he showed himself to them, a couple of the disciples. But the point is, not a one of them believed that he had risen from the dead. We call Thomas Doubting Thomas, when in fact it was not Doubting Thomas. He was no more a doubter than the rest of them. He may have had more faith than the rest of them. But, you know, he was just more real. You know, he said, I won't believe it's you, Lord, unless I can touch you and, and prove it. You know, I want to put the I want to put my fingers in the scars. So Christ allowed that to happen, but you know, not one of the disciples were waiting on him at, at, at the you know at the tomb on the third day. As far as waiting for his resurrection, there was a few waiting to anoint his dead body, but you know they weren't waiting on his resurrection. They all went back to the houses in fear and then trembling and crying and weeping and you know. Oh, Lord, it is, woe is me. What's going to happen to me now? What are they going to do to me now? I was sure he was, you know, I was sure he was who he said he was. And we saw him nail him to that tree. And so, you know, what are we going to do now? Not a one of them thought about what Christ had said, that I'm going to suffer at the hands of sinners and be crucified and the third day rise. Apparently not a one of them realized that. So, you know, but when he did rise, it says he, you know, Condemn them for unbelief. That's what the Bible says. It uses a different word, but it means the same thing. It says scolded them for their unbelief. So they didn't even realize the basics. So he didn't tell them everything. He said, I've told you. So it, it, it was the same thing when he was talking about the Holy Spirit. He was using words that they could understand at the time, and he even, he even came out and said it. He said, I have many things to tell you that you cannot bear, is the way it's in the King James. It means you cannot understand. You're not ready. He said, I have many things to tell you that you cannot bear right now. You cannot understand right now. But when the Comforter comes, he will teach you all things. Now, he threw a little hint in there as to who the Comforter is. He says, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. That's what he said when he was talking about spirit. He said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. And he was talking about the Holy Spirit. Uh, he said, uh, in one place he said, I believe he may be even the same place. He said, you both know him. He said, he dwells with you and he shall be in you. When the person who was dwelling with them was Christ. And he shall be in you. It was Christ. And of course, Christ, it meant Christ the Spirit, not, not Christ the man. It meant the Spirit of Christ. And of course, in uh, in the uh, epistles, it says he has sent forth the spirit of his dear son into us, crying, "Abba, Father." So, once again, we see that the Holy Spirit is the spirit of his dear son. And of course, 
It's because we're all sons and daughters of God. And that He, once again, is God Almighty. And it simply means that the same God that became a man for us and then went back to heaven and became the Spirit for us, or, or, or came back as what He was, the Spirit for us and indwelt us. He has recreated us on the inside. And now the Spirit of His dear Son cries, Abba Father, which means Daddy God. That's what it literally means, is Daddy God. It cries Daddy God inside of us. So we are all sons and daughters of God. You know, Christ was the firstborn of many brethren. A lot of people that get it wrong, a lot of people think that when it says He was the only begotten of God, that that simply means that, you know, they, they go through all these religious things, and I am going to get off here for long. I'm just, I, I get started, and, you know, I think, I think God wants me to tell you something, so i got to finish it. Uh, you know, they go through all these theological things about what what it means to be the only begotten of the Father, and they say it means uh, the one and only special one, and, all, and, and it does, it means all that. But what it really means is that Christ is uh, the only person that ever you know, was born of God Almighty. Christ is the only one born without an uh, earthly daddy. Mary was the only woman that was ever a virgin and conceived a child. I mean, it's so simple, and yet people just sit and split hairs over it all day long as to what, the, the, you know, what it means to be the only begotten of the Father. Because later on in the Bible it says that we've been begotten by the gospel, and that, that, that's why that is why that people split hairs over it and try to figure it out because they really don't have a clue what you know what they're doing. It's simple as this: God was a spirit, is a spirit, always will be a spirit, and he was known as God the Word, and he manifested himself in the womb of a virgin as sacrifice to show mankind that he loved them, period, to die for us. You know, he says, no greater love is any man than to lay down his life for another. Remember that. Well, you, you lay down your life for somebody, you there's no, no greater love, of course. So he was showing you that God cannot have a greater love and that he doesn't have a greater passion and that he doesn't have any greater desire than for you because he laid down his life. He became a man and laid down his life. He became a man in every way that you, you and I are, meaning mankind. In every way that you and I are mankind, he became man, except for sin. That's the only thing he doesn't have is he never had sin. He was like the Adam in you know before the sin, before the before the fall. He, he was perfect. That's why the Bible calls him the second Adam. The first Adam was was Adam that we know of, and he ended up falling, following you know following Eve and, and going into sin, and thereby condemning every one of us. And it was all by God's plan, believe it or not. I know I don't sit good with a lot of people, but it's true. It didn't catch God by surprise. God never did have a plan to, uh, you know, like, like people think. He never did want to be a dictator and rule over people. He wanted people to just simply choose Him and love Him just because He was Him, just because of who He was. And He knew ever, you know, He knew from the very second Adam and Eve were created what would happen. He wasn't cruel. He wasn't being cruel. He just simply knew, and he knew what he, you know, he knew what his plan was for the world. You know. Holy, 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 all things are possible. If you only believe, only believe, only believe, all things are possible if you only believe. One more time. Only believe, only believe, all things 
die for simple if you only believe only believe only believe all things are possible if you only Thank you. Love you guys.